reared their ugly heads and now is causing strife and conflict in the church where, where Timothy is pastor. And here, essentially chapter one says to Timothy, Timothy, stay there. You know, the, the tendency is when things get hard, we choose to run. I want another assignment. I'll go pastor another church. But he's telling Timothy, stay there for the Lord's sake, for your work's sake, for the people's sake, and for your own sake, because the conflict and the difficulties in life are designed to make you more and more like Jesus Christ. The hard times, the trials are designed to cause you to grow. And so that's what's happening here. And he tells, he tells this pastor, this is where you begin. This is how we correct the conflict and get the false teachers out. First of all, I urge you, I'm pleading with you, pray. Pray. Let's look at it in verse 1. I exhort, therefore, that first of all, that is the priority. Pray for your government. Pray for the men in your church. Who should we pray for? He says, you know what? Prayer should be the priority. You don't have to guess about what you are to do, where you're to begin. Here's where prayer begins. Pray in the church. Prayer is a spiritual force. Just as real as gravity, just as real as electricity, just as real as the rising and the setting of the sun, prayer is a force, and that is where you begin. That is where you need to maintain the priority. Pray. You know, and I know, that God controls all of creation, the wind, the waves, and the weather. We just have to ask Jonah about that. We'll get an amen from him. But God also controls the rising and falling of nations. Proverbs 21.1 says the king's heart is in the hand of the Lord. As the rivers of water, God turns the hearts of the kings whithersoever he will. So whom should we pray for? Pray for the government. Because, when, you know, the first thing we ought to do, prayer. And prayer reminds us, look, God is in charge, not the people. We are dependent on him and not vice versa. We pray, God hears. He gives our prayers their due weight as he considers all the influences, all the factors that are involved in the situation that we're praying about. And sometimes God says yes, sometimes God says no, and sometimes God says wait. But we can have confidence in this. I urge you to pray. God is too wise to make mistakes, he's too loving to be unkind, and he's too powerful to be thwarted, so we should pray. First of all, main priority, maintain this priority, pray. Pray for who? Pray for everyone. How should we pray? What kinds of prayers should we pray? According to verse 1, you know, there are seven New Testament words for prayer, different angles or different nuances of prayer. He uses four of them here. He says, I'm urging you to pray for, he says, supplications. Supplications are specific requests for specific needs brought unto the presence of a king. We're going to God, pray specifically for your specific need. He says, offer up prayers. That's a general term. You can approach God in, in different ways with different prayers. And then he goes, he adds in, right after prayers, intercessions. Intercessions, what are they? They are us entering into, confidently, a personal conversation with God, presenting our requests on the behalf of others. I'm coming into the presence of a king as he and I have a one-on-one -on -one relationship. I have access to the Father by Jesus Christ, and I have this conversation with the creator of all the universe, so I can pray, he's the creator of all, and so he's the creator of all men, so I pray for all men. And I have that access by faith into his presence to obtain grace and favor in time of need. The classic example of an intercession is when uh, Moses comes before God. The people of Israel sinned a great sin against God in making a golden calf and worshiping it. And intercession is pleading on the behalf of another. And he, listen how intercession cares more about the person being prayed for than self. This is how Moses intercedes for the people. He says, And Moses returned unto the Lord, Exodus 32, 31, and said, Oh, this people have sinned a great sin and have made them gods of gold. 
Yet now, if thou wilt forgive their sin, and if not, blot me, I pray thee, out of thy book which thou hast written. He cared about them so much that he would offer himself in their place. He's interceding on the behalf of others. And then Paul goes on to say, not only supplication, prayers, intercessions, but giving of thanks. Giving of thanks is when we rehearse how good God has been to us. You know, we sing this song, count your many blessings, name them one by one. We look back, we sing, and we, we, we say, oh yes, God did this, God gave me this, God gave me that. Yeah, I didn't like this, but he gave me that sickness, that accident, that loss of a job. He did all those things, and they turned out to be blessings because they caused me to bow my knee and draw closer. I look back, and I give thanks with a grateful heart for what God has done. So he's saying, pray that way. Supplications, prayers, intercessions, giving of thanks. And pray for all men, their needs, their relationships, their sins, their victories, whatever it is. Humble yourself, worship, trust God, and be thankful. And pray, according to verse 2, for those in authority, for kings, for all that are in authority. Because hostile government leaders, back then, during the New Testament times, as well as today, around the world, hostile government leaders attempt to control the rights of the church to meet and to worship and to evangelize. Paul urges prayer for all those in authority that the government might permit the free expression of religion. Our country is an epitome of that fact. I want to just briefly go over you, to you forms of government, systems of government which God has, has placed in our creation in this world. The first is self-government. The first of the four systems of government is self-government. And what does that mean? God has created each human being with dignity because they are created after the image of God. They are to be able to self-rule. This is foundational. If you don't have self-rule, you cannot have family government, you cannot have church government, you cannot have civil government. There must be self-rule. And because you're created in the image of God, that is a possibility, but not apart from God. Only under the lordship of Jesus Christ, only under the kingship of God and his authority can you have that fruit of the Spirit, which is self-control. Proverbs 25, 28 says, He that hath no rule over his own spirit is like a city that is broken down and without walls. You know, there's a man, Solomon, the wisest man that ever lived. He looked for meaning. He looked for truth. He looked for purpose for living under the sun. He did everything he could do under the sun. In other words, under, under the sun meaning no influence from heaven, no influence from God. I mean, he did it all. He built things. He built zoos. He built academies. He built gardens. He built everything. He built navies. He built armies. He had such great success. He had wives and many of them. He had many children. He, he sought for satisfaction in every single thing that he could find upon the earth. And at the end, he said this, it's all empty. It's vain. It's chasing after the wind. Nothing on this earth will satisfy. Nothing. Relationships, money, whatever you think that could satisfy a human heart, it can't apart from God. And so at the end of that book, Ecclesiastes, he, he rounds up this, this he, he summarizes his whole pursuit of life to find meaning and truth. And this is what he concluded, Ecclesiastes chapter 12. Let us hear the conclusion of the whole matter. Fear God and keep his commandments, for this is the whole duty of man. For God shall bring every work into judgment with every secret thing, whether it be good or whether it be evil. So here, he is talking about wisdom. The fear of God is the beginning of wisdom. The fear of God is self-government under God's rule. So that's the first form of government, self-government. If there is no self-government, nothing else can come into place in regards to the government. Then there's family government. Genesis 2, 24. Therefore shall a man leave his father and his mother and shall cleave unto his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. That's family. God, is, God established family. And the Bible says that Christ is the head of the husband, the husband is the head of the wife, and the parents are the head of the children. That is the family government. That's how God wants family government to rule. Then there is church government. Jesus said, I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. And the whole New Testament is about how a pastor and the deacons 
pastors and deacons, lead church, church members, church programs, according to New Testament. And then the last is civil government. Romans chapter 13, don't turn there, but I'll summarize it for you. The civil government has been set to create a, and maintain a righteous and just environment. In other words, an environment where life and free expression of faith can be exercised. That's the purpose of government. The two specific purposes under government, if you read Romans 13, 1 through 7, is the protection of its citizens. Genesis 9, 6, after God judged the entire world for violence and evil through the flood, he gave this rule, Genesis 9, 6, Whoso sheddeth man's blood, by man shall his blood be shed. For the image of God, for in the image of God made he man. Okay, that's another form of saying thou shall not kill. The purpose of government is to protect life, to protect its citizenry. That's the first purpose of government. The second purpose of government is to protect private property. You say, what? There is a commandment called, thou shall not steal. God endorses the use of private property and ownership. And it's really not yours. You're just a steward of it anyway. You only have it for 70, 80 years. But government is supposed to protect life and protect pro property, and that's why socialism is breaking the Eighth Commandment, robbing from the rich and stealing the poor. Personally, I believe we should all pay a flat rate, but uh, that's a whole other discussion. So here we have the purpose of government, and here is Paul saying, pray for those now in government. Having those ideas in the back of your mind that the purpose of government is, is to create an environment for the free exp expression of freedom, freedom of faith. So he says, pray for those in authority, for kings and all those in authority. Now, if, you're, if you don't know, at this time, there is a, a Roman emperor called Nero, and he is just wicked. He kills Christians, you know, at the drop of a hat. In fact, I think he will be responsible for, the, for Paul being beheaded in just a few short years from when the writing of this letter. And you think, we're to pray for them, that man? But he's killing us. He's killing our people. Yes, you are to pray for that man, those kings and those who are in authority. The New Testament teaches that a Christian is to be loyal to the government in which he is, he is under, except when the government orders him to disobey God. And when that happens, we say we'd rather obey God than men. So, that's who we should pray for. Why should we pray for them according to the second part of verse 2? The second part of verse 2 says this, that we may pray for those in authority and for all that are in authority, that we may lead a quiet and peaceable life in all godliness and honesty. So when we pray, let's pray this way, that we should pray for a quiet and a peaceable life. That's why we pray for kings and those in authority above us, that we might have a quiet life. The word quiet there has the idea of, of external peace, that there is no war going on. Okay, you know when wars go on in different countries, you know what happens? They kick out the missionaries. They reject visas, so missionaries cannot return. So let's pray for the peace of the land and your government, the external aspect of peace, the outward circumstances, that there would be an absence of disturbances or persecution. Okay, so pray for those in authority that, there, that we might have a quiet life, a peaceable life. The idea of peace is tranquility that arises from a right relationship with God. Peace on the inside, okay? Knowing that God is in control of every circumstance geopolitically. In our country and around the world, God is still sovereign. He's in control. And because I know he's in control, the, the, the tempest, the raging storm, whatever is happening in my life, which is causing me to feel like I'm overwhelmed or I'm drowning, I think of Peter. He walked on water for a few steps and he sank. And everything that was causing him to drown, he's underwater. But you know what? Jesus' feet is above the storm. The flooding waters are under his feet. No matter what is happening to me, I have internal peace because God is in control. 
Jesus is the Lord of the storm and the trial and the circumstances so that you might live peaceably in all godliness. That, that, that phrase has the idea of me having a desire to please God. What does God want me to do in this situation? Not what I want to do, but what does God want to do? And if this is what God want, wants to do, then he works in me that I might do what he wants to do. An attitude to please God and have reverence toward God. Then he goes, and in all honesty, the idea of that word honesty is, is gravity or weightiness, um, a dignity that gives respect to others. So now he says, look, that you, pray for peace, pray for quietness, pray, pray for godliness um, towards God, reverence toward God, and dignity and respect towards men. That's what he's praying for. And remember the context of what's going on in the church. There's internal strife because false teachers are there. So we pray for civil government because no government is worse than bad government. No government is anarchy. Even in bad government, even in corrupt government, there, there is a semblance of, of law and order. So we are to pray for those in authority. We pray for earthly peace where we live, not that our lives could be comfortable, but that our lives could be fruitful, that we can express faith boldly without compromise. So we pray for earthly peace and an atmosphere of peace that, that produces an ability to share faith. He goes on to say, how should we pray? Jump to verse 8. I will therefore that men pray everywhere, lifting up holy hands without wrath and doubting. So here he, he, he says, I will, I desire. I conclude from all that I've just said that all men, that men, by the way, the word men here is speaking about not humanity, but specifically men in the church who are leading, who read scripture and who pray. So when you get up here, scripture readers, when you get up here, pastor, this is the requirement for answered prayer. Here are the qualifications, knowing that you can be heard of God and your prayers can be answered. I will, therefore, that men pray everywhere, lifting up holy hands without wrath and doubting. So here's public prayer. He concludes that, listen, there are three qualifications here. You are to lift up holy hands. Do you know that in the Bible we're not told to put our hands together and bow our heads to pray? Okay, there are many postures given in the Bible, but the most common is this. Lifting up holy hands in prayer to God. And not because I'm lost in awe and wonder, but because here, my hands represent a holy life. My hands represent actions that honor and please God. So I will have you men in the church, when you pray publicly, you lift up holy hands. Those holy hands are representative of a holy life. So that there is no internal struggle. There is no... Strife, arguing in the church. It's not about the physical posture. It is about the inward life. I deliberately choose to live a life of holiness that pleases God. So lift up holy hands. And then he goes on to say, without wrath and doubting. The idea of wrath is that there is something unsettled between you and another believer. There is anger or bitterness if you harbor that in your heart and you stand up to publicly pray, God is not going to hear you. You are living a lie. So fix that problem between you and another man or another person in the church. In order to fix that problem, you have to confess your sin and also have the ability to forgive those who sin against you. So go without wrath, without anger or bitterness when you pray. And then he goes on to say, without doubting. Okay, the word doubting can have two different meanings here, and I think both are meant here. The word doubt means internal self, internal self arguing. You know, this is what God wants me to do. No, this isn't, isn't what God wants me to do. Ah, uh, should I do this? I shouldn't do that. So there's doubt about God's word and his promise internally, personally. But in context, it can also mean that there is internal argumentation with another person in the church. Okay? God wants us to have faith. If you come in prayer without faith, you might as well not pray. Men who pray publicly are to have confidence that God hears, that they are right with God, they're right with men, and they can have the confidence that God is going to answer. 
So we can summarize these qualifications by saying, hey, listen, you're to have holiness of life, selfward, inwardly. You're to have uh, peace outwardly with man. And then you're also to have unquestioning faith upwardly toward God. And he goes on to say in verse 3, as we consider the will of God, he says, for this is good and acceptable in the sight of God our Savior. So if you do these things, praying with holy hands, not having strife between you internally or someone else, if you do these things, this is good in God's sight. This is well-pleasing to God. And he, go, he adds this, this title, God our Savior. This is who God is. This is his person. He saves. Jesus' name means the Lord is salvation because Jesus saves. It is good and acceptable that you pray for those in authority, that you pray for kings. It is good and acceptable that you lift up holy hands and pray for a quiet and a peaceable life. It is good and acceptable that you do it without strife and without doubt. This is, in God's sight, good. So keep doing this because God is our Savior. In verse 4, we see the mission here. Who will have all men to be saved and come into the knowledge of the truth. So God accepts your prayer for all men because he has, his desire is for all men to be saved. So it is right for us to pray for those in government, all men in government to be saved. And all men everywhere to be saved. That's God's will. He's not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. Yes, God does teach election, which means he chooses the, the, those who are saved, but those who are saved are those who, in, those who are in Christ. There is God's part. He is going to provide somebody. In fact, he'll pr provide one body. He'll say it here. Look at verse 4 and 5. He wants you to come to the knowledge of the truth, and here's the truth. There is one mediator between God and man, the man Christ Jesus. There is one God. So God's desire is that all men will be saved. And the way they get saved is they come to the knowledge of the truth. The knowledge of the truth is that there's only one way to be saved. There's only one mediator. A pastor can't stand between you and God. A priest can't stand between you and God. Mary can't stand between you and God. Saints can't stand between you and God. Angels can't stand between you and God. There's only one man that can do that. The man, Jesus Christ, who is God fully and man fully. In his humanity, he touches the earth. He is identified with human beings. But in his deity, he touches the heavens. And so he is the only way to heaven. There is no other mediator. He said it in this way in John chapter 14, the night or the eve before the crucifixion. I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father but by me. And Paul is saying it in a different angle here. There's only one mediator between God and man, the man Christ Jesus, who God will have all men to be saved and come to knowledge of the truth. So we tie then that in with prayer, with government. God wants government to be able to have or give believers liberty to preach truth in a place that is peaceable and quiet. So we pray for un un unconverted loved ones. We pray for unconverted civil government leaders. A second reason that we pray is that, look, that the gospel may go out, that the mediator may be made known. There is one God. That's the Old Testament. Israel was to, was to live that and preach that. There's only one God. There's only one mediator, he says here, between God and man. And then there's only one method, verse 6. Verse 6 says, Who gave himself a ransom for all to be testified in due time. This is Jesus Christ who gave himself a ransom. The word ransom means a price paid to release or to set another free. That's the method. There is no other way. Jesus died in my place. That's what Paul is saying here. This ransom is for all. It was sufficient for all sinners, but it's only efficient for those who come to the knowledge of the truth by faith. Over and over again, we see this truth in the Scripture. The second half of verse 6 says, to be testified in due time. Okay, we live in the age and the grace of the time when God sent forth his Son, made of a woman, made under the law, to redeem us. That was the due time. And we are participants and recipients of the grace of the gospel. We live in the gospel age of which we are supposed to preach. 
as we can see there in verse 7, Paul says he's been chosen by God to serve as a missionary. He says, wherefore, I am ordained a preacher. A preacher is a herald, a proclaimer, a preacher, an apostle. Literally, he's an apostle of Christ, specifically chosen by Jesus Christ himself to represent God in the world and to speak on, with authority what God wants, to plant churches, to establish churches, to exercise discipline in churches. So that's Paul's calling. And he goes on to say, and a teacher of the Gentiles. A teacher is somebody who just unfolds the Bible and, and teaches people the truth about spiritual things. You and I are called to teach and make disciples. We are messengers ourselves. Go ye therefore and teach or make disciples of all nations. All of us, not just pastor, not just clergy, not just pastoral staff or church staff. All of us are are commanded to make and mature disciples. So as I close here, listen to all that Paul has said here about how we are to be involved in government. First of all, pray. Make sure you're on praying ground. Okay. Confess sin. Put it in the past. Receive the washing of sin by the shed blood of Jesus Christ. Confess your sin. Move forward in faith. Pray for those in authority, government leaders. Pray that doors of ministry continue to stay open and have peace in the land. Pray that all men might be saved. And pray for yourself, okay? Set aside time to pray. How do I, how do I bring this home to my life tonight and tomorrow? Set aside time to pray every day. Set aside a time and a place Set aside the phone, set aside the schedule, set aside television, set aside whatever is a distraction, take time to pray daily. And at the same time, have an attitude of prayer. You can pray when you're jogging, you can pray when you're driving, you can pray when you're doing the dishes, you can pray continually. Pray. Pray in holiness. Confess your sin. Make sure you are right with God, and then make sure you are right with men. Holy hands, without anger or bitterness toward anyone, with reverence to God and and respect and dignity towards men. Have that attitude of prayer, and then pray for all those in authority. Participate, influence, be salt and light where you are and can. Register to vote. Show good works that men might see your good works and glorify your Father which is in heaven. And lastly, pray that you have courage to witness, courage to speak, because you've been called to preach the gospel of Jesus Christ. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we do thank you for the privilege of living in a government where we have a vote Help us to be faithful, to influence this world for good. Help us to exercise discernment when we vote. Vote according to biblical values. Praying for those in authority, that they might be saved, that they might turn from sin to worship the living God. Help us all to be faithful in this thing. Prayer. Help us to maintain that priority. For if the church is thrown off because no prayer, then we have no power, personally or as a family of God. We confess our sins. We claim the blood for you are faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Thank you. Help us to have courage to speak and the fortitude and the consistency to pray. For we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.